classic cars Then Donald loves you So Donald, tell them what we're driving. Today we're driving a bit of my automotive youth. This is a 1966 Oldsmobile 442. And uh, it's always pronounced 442, not 442 or right. 442. It's a 442. And there's always debate about where it came from. I, as <laughs> I understand it to be, it was a four-barrel carburetor, four-speed transmission, dual exhaust. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, that was a very clever name that uh, the marketing folks came up with, which happened to match the spec for a moment. But then there became so many variations in the spec Right. That 442 and then they were simply automatic, the name. So yes. it became 400 cubic inch, four barrel carburetor, right. fuel exhaust. Yeah. <laughs> so, sort of think, think of what, what it is that you want it to be. See, I have a whole different feeling about these cars. I didn't, this and the Buick Riviera, I didn't list in the muscle car thing. Huh. Because prior to this, Remember, there was no Turbo R Bentley. There was no right. Bentley Continental. There was, but it was the six-cylinder. It was mm -hmm. in the 50s. Yeah. You know, there was no Iron Fist and a Velvet Glove Gun. This was for the guy, for the more mature businessman who had a, some sporting pretensions, who wanted something powerful and fast. Uh, with the exception of the four-speed transmission, it's an Oldsmobile. Wow. And this is the thing that makes it sporty. And, and it was comfortable, had air conditioning, you could take a long trip with it. It is, it is one of those things that uh, we often talk about, the great GM ladder of brands. Right. And by this point in the mid-1960s, to my view, things were getting a little complex and confused. Right. Because practically every one of the brands had some sort of a sports slash performance car. Right. They all had a luxury car. They all had a station wagon. They were doing all things to all people, except perhaps for Cadillac, of course. But it's really interesting, too, because this is, I think, one of the golden eras of GM design. Um, these Bill Mitchell uh, era cars were so incredibly clean and sleek. Right. And so the fact that this has, and also today, the name Oldsmobile sort of has a if, if people know about Oldsmobile at all, it has sort of a strange connotation, right. old man's car, all of that. Right, right. But um, as we were discussing before, Oldsmobile was the performance brand at oh, General years, Motors yeah. in the early 1950s, mid-1950s. And Pontiac didn't try to steal that moniker until the 1960s, but Oldsmobile wasn't going to give it away. I think Oldsmobile was the first one to have an automatic transmission. And they also pioneered, they, they got the overhead valve and at the same time as uh, Cadillac, Cadillac, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. But I remember I got a big blow up uh, painting in my garage. Look, Ma, no clutch. And the guy's got a flashlight <laughs> and he's shining it on the floor, you know? And, and that was a huge deal. I mean, this thing is fun to drive. I, I, it makes me smile. You know what's so funny? To me, cars are like people that have good posture. If a car is <laughs> sitting right, I find it very appealing. This car belongs to the Audrain collection. And when I saw it, I, I said, you know, you should buy this car. There's something, I just like the way it had nice posture. Well, and, and that's an important thing, especially yeah. in a car of this age, because so many of them were frankly neglected. And what goes first, besides the body, right. in California, the suspension. Right. The cars sort of sit, they, they, the, the wheel doesn't stand straight. Um, and you sort of get the, the dog walk right. uh, drive and you know and, all that stuff. And you also have to remember, when you bought a performance car in the uh, early 60s, <laughs> you opted for no power steering, no power brake, because you wanted all performance. This was for the guy that liked performance, but wanted his comfort and ease of operation as well. So it, as a matter of course, it just came with automatic, power brake, discs in front, drums in back, just what you need to get the job done. Uh, I mean, sure, you could make them even faster, maybe if you took off a lot of that stuff. But the idea was you wanted a fast, comfortable, point A to point B kind of car. You know, the Pontiac was probably ordered without power steering, without power brake, and, you know, the tri-power and no air conditioning or any of that, you know. Whereas this, this is a big 
fast, comfortable luxury car. To me, in the style of a Bentley Continental or or, or, or even a Turbo R Bentley. Yeah, it's a um, it's definitely something for the uh, a gentleman's express, as it were. Right. Um, for for a General Motors product, and also the fact that this is a car that's a bit of a sleeper. You know, if you want to have a fast car that performs well, but you don't want to shout it, I mean, right. what could be more subtle than this black on black 442 coupe? Right. You know, it looks like another intermediate sized Oldsmobile two door hardtop, except for those very small badges. Right. And of course, people that know look for the dual exhaust. Um, and the fact that it's got this great big uh, shifter in it. And of course, I love also the, uh, the vacuum gauge which is yeah. very much of the period to remind you of the fuel economy yeah. that you want to get, obviously, in your 442. Um, and it's in a place that immediately falls to the eyes. Right. So right. if you're reading your vacuum gauge and you're not driving your you're 442. You're like, ah, bang! <laughs> it's down on the, I remember when the Chryslers of the early 60s you have the tachometer down on the transmission tunnel. So stupid. <laughs> yeah, it's But it's you slightly... know, it's a nice driving car. And I kind of like the look of this body style. I love the look of this body style. More than the later, you know, the, the Pontiac had the Endura front end. That yes. Was, I, I guess so. I, I, you know, I like seeing chrome on, when I see chrome on an automobile now, oh my God, it really stands out. And especially in a car like this, because the chrome was used very, very sparingly. Right. So it really does act as an accent. As I said, I think this period of design at General Motors was absolutely terrific. And also what's really interesting about uh, this car, just like the Pontiac GTO, was the fact that the 442 was was launched initially as a package right. on the Cutlass, and so you could same buy the GTO, four, same as the GTO, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. a package on the Tempest. Um, and I recently learned, much to my surprise, that there were actually a few, very few, 442 four doors built. And when you think about the sports sedan, can you imagine? Oh, look at that. Exactly. I mean, it pulls nicely. Can you imagine? And look uh, how much room there is. Exactly. You know, exactly. most cars now, you look like two guys on a grinder date. You're sitting right next to each other. <laughs> Whereas this, oh, we got all kinds of room. It's amazing. You can actually reach into the back seat, which is a real back seat. Yeah. It will fit grown ups. You know, the Ford version of this was a car my dad, I taught him to hold the bike. The 7 liter. That was the Galaxy. Available with a four-speed on automatic, but a 428, disc brakes, fastback styling, you know. That Although was it wasn't a, the Galaxy, though. That was a step up, because that was a full-size car. The equivalent would have been the... Well, this uh, is a full-size car, isn't it? No, this is the Intermediate. Is this really... This is the I, Intermediate, absolutely. This, this is on, it's on the Cutlass chassis. It's not I on the 88. Yeah, yeah. Guess, so. It's so funny. <laughs> it's so huge. <laughs> this, this, this is not, I just assumed this was a little bigger than the GTO, is it? No, same same, uh, same I platform. That, yeah, I guess you're right. Same right. platform. Yeah. Um, but uh, so that would have been a, um, a fair lane. Uh, yeah, I guess they were still fair lanes in right, 66. Right. They hadn't come out with the Torino yet, so it's still fair lane. Um, but again, it's still one of the fair lane 500 XL. I mean, there were these wonderful things. So I said, it brings me back to my youth. These are the cars that I read about in the car magazines when I was first becoming car aware. Right. And, uh, and I gravitated towards cars like this because for whatever the reason growing up in New York City, I loved European cars, uh, even though of course I rarely saw them. So the American cars that I would see and that I would lust after were the ones that sort of had the most European feel and this yeah. was one of them, you know. What I imagine to be a European feel, at least. You know, even with the dashboard, I remember uh, looking at contemporary Opals, and there was a lot of that design in these cars. And again, going back to the point of the 442, that sort of made nonsense of the name, but nonetheless, it was a 442 right. with a tri-power, which is not a single four-barrel carburetor, but discuss. Um, but, you know, again, I, I love the idea of a car that can have this kind of performance and usability. Uh, come back to that a lot in, in contemporary cars, but realizing that that was the norm. Yeah. You know, nobody thought about buying a car that you could only use on certain days of the week. Right. Even people that bought cars to drag race, they still use them to go to work right, during the right. week. As much as I 
much did I say I don't like power steering? I like it in this because it just makes it so one finger effortless, you know? Yeah, I uh, remember quite uh, vividly my father driving his Catalina and making one finger turns or, or palming the steering wheel, which is also yeah, yeah, a great yeah. thing, too. I thought, you know, you can't, don't try that on your Duesenberg. No. You won't get very far. They <laughs> use a call a necker knob right. or a suicide knob. Yeah. yeah. I can never actually get the, the hang of actually using one of those. It was always more of a pain somehow. Yeah, yeah, I kind of don't mean. <laughs> but this is a car you could drive, you know, Boston and New York back in the day, you know. I mean, it was, it's a really a long distance. And that fourth gear is pretty long-legged. Let's see what it does. What does fourth gear do? Well, we don't have a tack, we have a vacuum gauge. If you think it. Well, it pulls pretty well in fourth at a fairly low oh, speed. Yeah, it's, it's a torquey motor. This is the motor that Max Bolchowski used. In, yes, in uh, his old Yellers. Yeah, yeah. in old Yeller, you know. These had all kinds of torque. And speaking of racing applications for Oldsmobile V8s, uh, in the Audrain collection, uh, there's the somewhat infamous rear-engine Scarab car that Lance Reventlow built after the failure of the front-engine uh, Formula One Scarabs, which is powered by an Oldsmobile engine. Oh, is that right? Real V8, yeah. yeah. And uh, quite famous for having only entered one race, a Formula Libra race, which it won, but then was parked because it wasn't good for anything else. It was certainly not good for Formula One, and there really wasn't uh, a lot of call for it. You know, in on, IndyCar racing. On Jay Leno's garage, like the one I do on YouTube, we had one of the old Zimbiles from the 90s, one of the quad fours. Oh, yeah. And that was a true racing engine. I mean, if you looked at it, you'd think it was something Leo Goosen made for Offenhauser or yes. one of those guys, you know? I mean, very impressive. And they got all kinds of power out of it. And I think they took it to Bonneville, ran 245 or some crazy thing. Yeah, there's some really interesting engineering and performance things going on at Oldsmobile, the Aerotech. Right. All those cars. It was really quite fascinating. It's a shame that uh, it all went away. So uh, let's see uh, what I make of this little piece yeah, of I'm my Yeah, I'm curious uh, to get your opinion my on childhood. this. It, it just, I mean, it's so funny uh, using my formula. If it looks right, it must be right. And it is. I was not disappointed when I drove it. When I, told, when I said, oh, you should buy this for the collection, I went, yeah, I hope I'm not too. But it, it's exactly as I thought it would be. Well, I can't wait to give it a try. We did a bit of work on it at my shop and put this dash in and did just, just a little detail work and it's fantastic. Here, take it, see what you think. It's so funny feeling a clutch this heavy and steering this light. I know, yeah, that's funny, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> power doesn't it? Yeah it does. I mean it's torque. It's so funny. Horsepower sells cars, torque wins races. That's always the old adage I think. That is it. You were talking about the uh, the power steering and it's an interesting combination of light steering and a heavy clutch right. and a heavy uh, gear change. Um, but the steering actually is not like super light. Right. It's not that uh, sort of, I have no idea what's going on on the road light. Um, it's not what you expect. No. Uh, it also, also, for a 1966 uh, GM car, it's very solid. Yeah. It's a really nice example. And uh, in the new Jay Leno manual transmission workout program, right. this would be actually a great uh, trainer for the advanced students right. because the clutch return spring is really strong. Right, right. <laughs> so I'm going to have uh, but it shifts calf nicely, muscles. It, it shifts beautifully. Yeah. And you know, it's very funny too because you don't think about sort of neat, slick manual gearboxes on American cars of the 1960s. Right. Um, but this is actually quite wonderful. The, uh, oh, that's actually very nice. Isn't that? I mean, yeah. Turning is great. It's seductive, this car. So 
third gear is the <laughs> one. Yeah. I mean, it pulls hard in third, doesn't it? It's amazing. Oh yeah, I love this thing. <laughs> you know, it's it's so funny thinking about cars of this period and the performance cars of this period. Uh, this, my beloved Corvair Corsa. Right. Um, you know, 1966 is a fairly interesting time for and you know, GM performance cars. I like the three two barrels because mm -hmm. two four barrels was always too much carburation. Right. You know, even the 427 Cobras and stuff that ran races, they ran with a single four barrel because you're just over carburating the car. Yeah. Whereas this three barrels, this three two barrel setup seems to be a little bit better. It keeps it a little more on tune. You're not yeah. flooding it like a fire hose, you know? You've got a much, much, much more even power delivery. Right. Um, which is really, uh, again, pleasurable and usable. The thing that is actually really surprising is the handling. Now I'm going to see how this goes on my favorite turn here. What's also great is that the heaviness of the controls, especially the throttle, also helps, I think, because you have to do the, you have to drive this car very intentionally. Right, right. You know, which is again something that people don't expect from a mid-1960s American car where they think, oh, you just sort of float along and do what you're going to do. Um, but the car really responds to that uh, intentional nature of, of, of piloting it. It's funny, I uh, remember doing a uh, little local road rally in the uh, 1957 Lincoln Premier Coupe that's, that's in the uh, Audrain collection. And there's a bunch of folks driving Porsches and things like that. And I'm keeping up with them. And uh, up until I get to the, the moment where I come to a fairly sharpish uh, right-hand turn, and I know plan ahead, here's where the turn is, this is where I put my steering input in, make the turn and you have this clunk 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 as the left front uh, hubcap goes flying That's off. That's funny. <laughs> Fortunately no hubcaps were harmed in the making of that turn and I got it back without damage. Now that's impressive. This is in second gear. Yeah. Yeah well you know the next time Jay Leno calls and says you know, I think this is car you ought to buy. You might listen to him. Yeah, this thing turned out to be good. Four, four, two. The numbers to remember. I think that ended about what, 72, 73, something like that? Yeah, I think as I recall, the 442 did not yeah. suffer the ignominy that some of the other great performance nameplates yeah. faced by being put on to cars with 82 horsepower right, and, right. Uh, you know, bench seats and automatic transmissions. Nor, of course, did they try to revive it um, when Oldsmobile was in its last gas. Right. I'm not sure it was, they were sorely tempted to do. I mean, just a few years before Oldsmobile went under, it was America's best-selling automobile. Yes. Which was amazing. The Cutlass Supreme outsold yeah. every Japanese car brand combined. Right, I just know. Just the Cutlass Supreme. I know, I know. It does sound like something you get at a deli, doesn't it? I'll have the Cutlass uh, Supreme, give me please. the Cutlass Supreme. The On rye. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. There's just something incredibly sad to me that a nameplate as, as old as venerated as Oldsmobile just yeah. disappeared overnight. It's just such a shame. But progress comes and we, who love old cars, yeah. get to enjoy the highlights of it. Yeah. Nevertheless, we get to enjoy Oldsmobile at its prime. 442. I thought you'd enjoy this thing.